Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation of Future Radio. Yeah, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Thursday, April 15th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well today. Well, in the uh, Derek Chauvin trial today in the murder of George Floyd, uh, the defense rested after two days and only seven witnesses. Uh, the defense rested. It was expected that the defense would go until um, Friday, but uh, the defense rested today, and the jury will start hearing closing arguments on Monday. It's very, very interesting today what happened in court. Uh, people had been questioning uh, for the past few weeks whether Derek Chauvin would actually testify in court, and Derek Chauvin pleaded, uh, exercised his Fifth Amendment rights not to testify, okay? So we, we only heard from him saying that he was not going to testify in court. All right, so, and then also the day the prosecution um, brought back um, expert witness Dr. Martin Tobin, the pulmonologist, uh, to refute the testimony from Dr. David Fowler, the medical examiner or former medical examiner uh, who testified on Wednesday. So it was very interesting, even though it was a short day, um, even though it was a short day in court, it's very inter interesting what happened today. So we're going to do a quick recap of what took place uh, in court today. And then also uh, we'll, give an update on what's going on with the Dante uh, Wright case. We know that the former officer who shot and killed Dante Wright, uh, Kim Potter, appeared in uh, court today, and that was virtually, appeared virtually in court, uh, and did not enter a plea also. So we'll do a brief update on that. Then, uh, there was a story that I did not get a chance uh, to get to, and, and I saw this story uh, Monday, and let's see, Monday, April 11th, and then I saw an update to the story also on April 14th. You have more than 100 corporate executives who held a uh, virtual conference call to discuss halting donations uh, and investments to political donations and investments to fight controversial voting bill, uh, voter restriction bills. Uh, there was an article from the Washington Post dealing with this from April 11th. Uh, there was a uh, article from NBC News from um, April 14th, uh, from Wednesday, April 14th. Hundreds of CEOs, celebrities, corporations joined forces to oppose discriminatory voting legislation hundreds of ceos uh celebrities corporations joined forces to oppose discriminatory voting legislation okay so uh, a lot of people have been asking when are the celebrities going to get involved etc when are the celebrities going to get involved so we're going to give an update on um what's going on with that also some very interesting developments now, on yesterday's show, we ended up doing two hours, and uh, I just finished editing the video from yesterday's show because I'm running, it, running into some technical difficulties. But um, we know the story dealing with the House Judiciary Committee and H.R. 40 in the House Judiciary Committee. That story broke while we were live on the air, and um, H.R. 40 uh, passed the House Judiciary Committee now has to go to the full House uh, floor for a vote. It's not sure when it's going to go to the full House floor for a vote. Uh, we'll see. But uh, check out the show from Wednesday, April 15th, because I went deep into um, what happened in H.R. 40, et cetera. Okay. Uh, but one of the stories I was going to deal with on Wednesday's show, but I had to push it till today because we dealt with the story of H.R. 40, is dealing with the Free African Society, the Free African Society of 1787. It was founded April 12, 
1787 by Richard Allen and Absalom Jones. You know, they also uh, founded the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, but th this is in Pennsylvania, the Free African Society of uh, Philadelphia, which was a mutual aid and religious organization. It was founded April 12, 1787, April 12, 1787. So we're going to talk some about the uh, Free African Society uh, also. Very, very uh, important piece of history. Now on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct your own behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. To sign up for our email newsletter, text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. Also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and sign up for the email newsletter there as well. Uh, if you'd like to stop for information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Uh, or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Click on the yellow donate button. It helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air uh, six days a week. All right. Uh, very quickly, coming up uh, here on the break, call in numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a quick question or comment. Uh, when we look at the Derek Chauvin trial, so I watched it again today. I've watched all 15 days. After calling seven witnesses over two days, Derek Chauvin's defense team rested in this case, in the case of the former Minneapolis uh, police officer's murder trial. Derek Chauvin spoke for the first time in court today, but only to inform the court that he would not testify, only to inform the court uh, that he would not testify. He said, quote, I will invoke my Fifth Amendment uh, privilege today, end quote. Now, Derek Chauvin is charged with second and third degree uh, murder and uh, second and third degree murder and second degree manslaughter in the death of George Floyd uh, that took place May 25th, 2020. Uh, the prosecution has presented several medical experts who testify that uh, George Floyd uh, died from as asphyxia after Derek Chauvin kneeled on his neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds. Now, the defense has argued that uh, George Floyd's death was caused by underlying heart conditions and drugs rather than the force of Derek Chauvin's restraint. Now, also, we saw the testimony on Wednesday, uh, April 14th, and Dr. David Fowler was totally destroyed by the prosecution by Prosecutor Jerry Blackwell. Uh, we're going to pick this up on the other side of the break because Dr. Martin Tobin was brought back on behalf of the prosecution today. We're going to let you hear what happened. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right, stand by. Stand by, everybody. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcasting and social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. Stand by. We'll be back from break in three minutes, in three or four minutes. Stand by. How's everybody doing?
All right, we'll be back from break in just a minute here. All right, we've got uh, Shelly, we've got Michael Johnson, Sharon, Rich, TC, uh, Anthony. Okay, stand by, everybody. We're back from breaking two minutes here. All right, welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is uh, Thursday, April 15th, 2021, and we are live calling numbers 313-778-7600, 313-778-7600. Here's the call in number if you have a question or comment. Um, right before the break, I was giving a brief update on what took place today, uh, day 14 in Derek Chauvin trial in the murder of George Floyd. We know the defense rested today. And also they brought back, uh, the prosecution brought back uh, Dr. Martin Tobin as well. We're gonna go to clip one in just a second here, Shakita. Uh, the prosecution has presented several uh, medical experts. Now they, the prosecution has presented 38 witnesses in total. They, pre pre they have presented several medical experts who testified that George Floyd died from asphyxia after Derek Chauvin kneeled on his neck for uh, nine, minute, uh, nine minutes and 29 seconds. Now, the defense uh, has argued that uh, George Floyd's uh, death was caused by underlying heart conditions and drugs re rather than the force of Derek Chauvin's restraint, which is very interesting. You just want to ignore that Chauvin kneeled on his neck for nine minutes and, and 29 seconds and that he kept kneeling on his neck after he was unconscious for, for three minutes. Okay. You just want to ignore all of that. Now, uh, Dr. David Fowler, who's a pathologist who did not examine Floyd's, uh, George Floyd's body. Now he's the former medical examiner, examiner there in Maryland. Also, uh, Dr. David Fowler, a pathologist, um, who did not examine George Floyd's body testified on Wednesday that carbon monoxide from the police car's exhaust while George Floyd was pinned down and his head was close to the tailpipe may have been a contributing factor to his death. Okay. Now he, he didn't know whether the car was running or not. Okay. This is something that prosecutor Blackwell uh, brought up uh, Fowler uh, did not know whether the car was running or not. One, two, if it was running, and I said this on yesterday's show, if the car was running, and the we 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 see here the uh, the picture and Chauvin on uh, uh, George Floyd's neck, okay, and George Floyd, his face is close to the tailpipe. Who put his face close to the tailpipe of the car? If exhaust from the tailpipe was the contributing factor to George Floyd's death, one, who put George Floyd's face close to the tailpipe? Two, who kept his face close to the tailpipe? Wouldn't that be negligence on the part of Derek Chauvin if, if your argument, Dr. David Fowler, is that uh, uh, exhaust from the tailpipe which gives off carbon monoxide contributed to George Floyd's death. So he was a paid witness too, by the way. Um, and then we know it was uh, based upon the testimony from uh, Dr. Martin Tobin, it was 91 and a half pounds of Derek Chauvin's body going down on George Floyd's neck also. Now, uh, so prosecutors in, in their rebuttal 
uh, today in court. Recall Dr. Martin Tobin, the world-renowned pulmonologist, to take the stand. Dr. Martin Tobin testified that he did not believe George Floyd's carbon monoxide level could have been as high as the defense proposed, okay, as Dr. David Fowler proposed, okay, okay. Uh, let's go to clip one, Shakita. Take it off mute. Okay, we'll, we'll get that uh, going. Uh, the defense rests. It has been okay, one of the largest ahead. questions looming over the trial whether Derek Chauvin would okay, take the stand in his own defense. Today, the answer. I will invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege today. Chauvin told the judge without the jury in the room that he would not testify. Uh, I have advised you. Uh, and we have gone back and forth on the matter would be kind of an understatement, right? Yes, it is. George Floyd's yeah. younger brother, Rodney, says it had been on his mind. I was hoping to see him get on that stand, but he didn't do it. it he he wanted, you wanted to see him testify. Yeah, I wanted to see him do something to accept some accountability. But legal experts say Chauvin's choice is no surprise. The biggest risk for putting Derek Chauvin on the stand is that he does the exact opposite of what you want him to do. Instead of humanizing himself, he comes across as looking cold to the jury, which further proves what the state is already trying to establish, that he's a direct cause of George Floyd's death. Also today, prosecutors tried to introduce as new evidence test results that specifically measure the carbon monoxide in Floyd's blood. The judge did not allow it. It's untimely. Scolding them for waiting until the last minute and warning that bringing up the previously undisclosed lab test to the jury could result in a mistrial. This late disclosure is uh, not the way we should be operating here. Instead, the prosecution called a sole rebuttal witness, Dr. Michael Tobin, back to the stand. The world-renowned pulmonologist disagreed with yesterday's defense expert, who testified exhaust from the police squad car could have been one of the contributing factors in Floyd's death. I believe it is not reliable. Closing arguments are now set for Monday. Then the case will go to the jury, which will be sequestered. If I were you, I would plan for long and hope for short, whether it's an hour or a week. It's entirely within your province. Monday for closing arguments. Well, Esther, the judge had indicated that he did not want the jury deliberating this weekend. Also, the prosecution and defense are still hammering out the exact wording for jury instructions, Lester. Okay, so um, that was from NBC Nightly News from April 15, 2021, defense rests in Derek Chauvin trial. So the jury will reconvene on Monday. The trial will start back up. Well, the We'll hear closing arguments uh, on Monday. Okay, so we'll give you an update on what takes place then. Uh, look out! For, look out for me Friday on Roland Martin Unfiltered. I'm a panelist each Friday uh, on Roland Martin Unfiltered, so I should be on uh, on, on Friday um, as well. So it should be really good. Uh, we're gonna talk. I don't. I don't know the topics we're gonna talk about, but the trial will probably be one of them. Uh, Dante Wright may be another one. We may talk about reparations also, H.R. 40. I know they talked about that today. Uh, he had Dr. Greg Carr on and uh, my friend Dr. Greg Carr and also Dr. Ray Winbush as well. They're both within COBRA. Uh, you know, Sunday, uh, I interviewed uh, Cam Howard, national male co-chair of Cobra, and we gave an update on H.R. 40, but we also talked about the upcoming vote in the, in the House Judiciary Committee that was taking place on Wednesday. OK. And then when the story broke that H.R. Uh, 40 passed the House Judiciary Committee to go to the full House floor for a vote. We talked about that extensively on Wednesday night's show. So go back and watch Wednesday's show. OK, uh, very quickly here, uh, I, I want to look at the updates from the uh, New York Times. Uh, key moments on day 14 of uh, Derek Chauvin trial, key moments of day 14 of Derek Chauvin trial. I want to hone in on the testimony once again from uh, Dr. Uh, Martin Tobin. Okay, so 
a, a pulmonologist for the prosecution said carbon monoxide did not play a role in George Floyd's death. Now, once again, when, when I watched it, when I watched the trial on Wednesday and I heard Dr. David Fowler say that carbon monoxide may play a role and all this. I mean, they're just throwing, they're just picking anything they can, you know, uh, it, to, to try to say the obvious is not what killed George Floyd. OK, we all saw it. They're trying to say the obvious. Derek Chauvin is not what killed George Floyd. Now, Dr. Martin, Dr. Martin J. Tobin, a prosecution medical expert, returned to the uh, witness stand Thursday as a rebuttal witness for the state providing the final testimony that jurors heard in the trial of Derek Chauvin. Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Tobin, a pulmonologist who testified last week, was brought back by prosecutors to offer a counter opinion to testimony given yesterday, Wednesday, by Dr. David Fowler, um, the former medical examiner of Maryland. Now, uh, Dr. Fowler said he believed that George Floyd died from cardiac arrhythmia, okay? Dr. Fowler said he believed that George Floyd died from cardiac arrhythmia, which was caused by multiple factors, including heart disease, drug use, and possibly carbon monoxide poisoning. Now, during Dr. Fowler's testimony, he acknowledged that he had not seen any testing of George Floyd's blood that showed carbon monoxide poisoning, but he believed that George Floyd's uh, carboxyhemoglobin, which is the combination of carbon monoxide and hemo hemoglobin, could have increased by 10 to 18 percent because he was be, he he was uh, being restrained near the exhaust pipe of the police squad car. Okay, once number one, Doctor Fowler did not examine George Floyd's body. Um, two, he did not test George Floyd's blood. Three, if your argument is that George a contributing factor was carbon monoxide poison from the tailpipe from the exhaust pipe of the car, the question I would ask. On cross examination would be one, who put George Floyd's face near the exhaust pipe? Two, who kept George Floyd's face near the exhaust pipe? Now, during his rebuttal testimony, Dr. Martin Tobin said that the idea that carbon monoxide caused George Floyd's death was quote unquote simply wrong. Tests performed by the Hennepin County, uh, by Hennepin County after George Floyd's death showed that George Floyd had a 98% oxygen saturation, Dr. Tobin said. That means the maximum amount of carboxyhemoglobin in his blood could not have been greater than 2%, Dr. Tobin said, which is, quote unquote, within the normal range, within the normal range. So that was the last witness they heard from. Hopefully, that is the final nail in Derek Chauvin's coffin, figuratively, not literally. OK. All right. Let's go to the phone lines quickly. Let's go to uh, line one. We have Norman line one. Norman, welcome to the African History Network show. Thanks for holding. Yes. How are you doing? All right. Hey, listen, I, yep. I think that would be the wrong argument to use that you said about who put uh, George Floyd. The best argument is, I believe is, is first of all, uh, carbon monoxide is a gas that you have to breathe in. And if the guy wasn't breathing in, and the kid breathe and said, I can't breathe. He can't breathe in carbon monoxide. Now, carbon monoxide is what, three, uh, ten times more absorbable in the blood system than uh, oxygen. If you were not getting any oxygen, you, I mean, uh, if you weren't getting any oxygen, you can't, because you can't breathe. You can't, can't be possible to get uh, a carbon monoxide. So, like you said, I, I, they're just throwing stuff up and at, at the wall, just as it came in, as you, well, it's just, it was his, his his drug use, you know. Right. The, uh, I guess it's standard uh, Negro reaction that we're all drug drug abusers. But then, well, then we go look at the history of drugs. We see that what these uh, what uh, Nixon's plan was is that the war on drugs was the war on black people to disrupt their neighborhood and their community. Right. Stuff, and then we're going to implant these drugs. So that's the standard uh, of uh, uh, operation of, 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 of mold there. And I just want to put another thing, too, 
you know, I write about this subject, particularly about black folks as it related to drugs, and we just published an article about that exposing the, the, the so-called drug policies in this country mm-hmm. by, the, by the VA targeting black health care providers. And the reason I point out, because these guys are police too. And the people say, well, gee, why are you talking about DEA? Because the DEA Dr- is also... Drug enforcement agency. Drug, against the, uh, yeah, drug enforcement is also used against the George Floyd protesters. A big article about this. And pull this up. What, what, what's the name of the article? What's the name of the... What's the... What's the name of the article? It's called, it's called the DAG bar authorizes DEA to be used against the, the to, to, to to spy on drug uh, on uh, George Floyd protesters June fourth, two thousand twenty. And in fact, there's a letter by it says, by Timothy Shea that says how they have switched the mission of the, the agency to target. Uh, Drug, drug for, for protesters. Well, what, what's the name of the publication? Just one second, Norm. What, what, what's the name of the publication? I, don't that, but I, I, I had to run to my computer here and get it there, but it is just pull up. Uh, well, DA, uh, okay, so protesters. so I've got I've got one article from Vanity Fair from June second, twenty twenty. The D, the DOJ. Is letting the Drug Enforcement Administration surveil protesters. Okay. And this is under yeah, William yeah. Barr. This is from Vanity Fair. William, yeah, William Barr and stuff. And uh, there's a, another article that I highlighted about that, but the most important is a videotape that goes in that article. And it also then it shows the, the, uh, author, the authorization that Tom Shade gave to his agency. To, to switch the mission to the uh, to, to target these protesters. So you remember when they when people were jumping out of vans, arresting people and stuff in Portland, Oregon. In Portland, Oregon, right, that? right, yeah, right. That was the DEA. And then when you start looking at look at the history of this agency, what did Nixon say he was going to do? Target black leaders and disrupt their communities and, and associate them with heroin and white hippies with with. Uh, yeah, with, uh, well, that was, marijuana. Yeah, that's arresting agency on that. Mm-hmm. Was, was was that's why it was formed. It was right, the drug war on drugs, and as he said, what did we? As Erlingman said, did we know we were lying? John Erlingman. Yes. Yeah. So, article, blah, so. Blah, 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 blah. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Our, we, my, we have a blog, an entire blog, a group of black uh, uh, pharmacists and 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 professionals formed an organization called the North Star Pharmacy Group, and we write a blog called You Are Within the Norms.com. You are within the norms.com, and it has these videos in here of documentary like Ed Bradley saying, hey, you know, it's targeting was the how the government funded programs to target areas within the black community and had the rest one place truly of Texas. Right. So 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 very quickly then very quickly then I have to let you go so I gotta get to these other topics. When you talk about Ehrlichman, you're referring to John Ehrlichman, just so people listening know John Ehrlichman was yeah. Richard Nixon's domestic policy advisor. So Richard Nixon declared his war on drugs June seventeenth, nineteen seventy one. Yeah, in front of Congress, asking for asking for the funds to fund the war on drugs. Now, John Ehrlichman, uh, April two thousand sixteen, there was a cover story for Harper's Weekly magazine. The name of the the name of the cover story was called "Legalize It All." It was written by a, a journalist named Dan Baum, B A U M. Dan Dan Baum interviewed John Ehrlichman back in about 1994. So John Ehrlichman served 18 months in in federal prison behind the Watergate scandal. And when uh, John when uh, Dan Baum interviewed Don uh, John Ehrlichman, Dan Baum said that John Ehrlichman told him that the war on drugs was a war on the African American community and a war on the anti Vietnam War protesters. And he said that he said that uh, John Ehrlichman told him we knew we, we knew we could not make it illegal to be black, and we knew we couldn't necessarily, you know, make it illegal to protest a war because of the First Amendment. 
but he said by uh, associating the anti-war movement with marijuana and by associating the African-American community with heroin, then we could raid their offices, we could do surveillance in their communities, we could break up their meetings, all different types of things like this. Okay, and this is and and this is right. this is what happened. So he was he was so the, the if people read that article and then all the news outlets picked up on this article. I did a lecture back in 2016 dealing with the history of the war on drugs right. and dealing with Nixon's war on drugs. Right. But actually, I, I went back to 1875 dealing with the uh, anti opium laws in China and, and yeah, the anti opium laws in San Francisco targeting Chinese men working on the railroads and I dealt with the history of drug laws. Uh, but check that out. Okay, go ahead with your last statement and I gotta get, I have to go ahead. Read our article about the war on, the war on drugs and, and the black pharmacists and the rape of China. We do a very good a documentary, I call it a docu article on that with videos in there that talks about, you know, how this opium war, how many people in this country, some of the richest folks in the world, just kind of the Delanoles, the Roosevelt's, the, uh, the Forbes, uh, the uh, Carries. All that was in Harvard University and Yale and all these other good universities and stuff. Uh, uh, that wealthy of the China trade is nothing but the opium trade and posing the opium on, on, onto the Chinese. And we want to know why the China wants to have a 500 uh, ship Navy because nobody's going to ride up on the Yankee River to pull over again, seeing these guns that, 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 that pose this kind of stuff. Right. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks for calling. Thanks for calling, Norman. Yeah. Keep listening. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, we're going to go to clip two here, Shakita. Uh, quick update on uh, what's going on also in uh, Brooklyn Center, uh, Minnesota also. Okay. So we go from Minneapolis, Minnesota to Brooklyn Center. So the former officer, uh, Kim Potter, who shot and killed uh, Dante Wright uh, during a traffic stop in uh, Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, made her first court appearance this afternoon. Now, also, there was a press conference where uh, the family of Dante Wright uh, spoke out as well. Now, Kim Potter appeared virtually and did not enter a plea. Uh, the judge set her next hearing for May 17th. She remains free on a $100,000 bond. Uh, now she's a 20, uh, Kim Potter, we know is a 26 year veteran of the Brooklyn Center Police Department. She was arrested and charged on Wednesday, April 14th with second degree manslaughter. She resigned from the force on uh, Tuesday. Now, police chief Tim Gannon, uh, who uh, has now also resigned from the force, called the shooting, quote unquote, accidental at a, a press conference a few days ago and said he believed uh, Kim Potter mistook her gun for her taser when she fired the single fatal shot. Uh, now, the shooting is just about 10 or 12 miles away from where George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we know it has also sparked uh, nationwide protests. Uh, now, on Wednesday, protesters gathered outside the Brooklyn Center uh, Police Headquarters for a fourth night of protests in spite of curfew. Hennepin, Hennepin County Sheriff David Hutchinson said authorities were shot at with quote unquote industrialized, uh, industrial sized fireworks, industrial sized uh, fireworks and uh, uh, spray paint rocks and other items. Okay. About 24 people were arrested according to Operation Safety Net. I want to go to clip two uh, today to give a, a, a quick wrap up on what took place today uh, dealing with the Dante Wright case. Let's go to this clip, uh, Shakita. We're still never going to be able to see our baby boys that we're never going to have again. Tonight, Dante Wright's family demanding tough justice for Kimberly Potter. If we can have life, we want life. We got to go life without him. We got to go life without you. The former police officer in court today, the media barred from showing it to the public, charged with second-degree manslaughter, facing up to 10 years in prison for killing Wright during a traffic stop. His family able to see Potter in court on Zoom. It hurt my heart. 
to see her sitting there, it so many emotions flowed through my body. I had hate, I had sadness, I had anger. Overnight, a fourth night of outrage. Hundreds of officers moving in to enforce the curfew. <laughs> Our NBC News team briefly detained by authority, then released. <laughs> At least two dozen arrests. Today, Minnesota's governor, who said he spoke to Wright's family, vowing to push for police reforms. You're less safe to be black in Minnesota than you are to be white right now. Meanwhile, Wright's family planning his funeral for next Thursday. Nobody should have to go through this. I don't care. White, black, brown, red, orange, whatever you are. Ron Allen, NBC News, Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. Okay, so um, tragedy there in um, Minnesota once again. And uh, go go listen to the show I did yesterday. Um, and uh, like I said, I read the early reports on this shooting the night that it happened. Uh, when I got off the air, you, you go back. It was Sunday night. I think of the first post I did was about 1130 p.m. about this shooting. And I'm sitting there trying to figure out how does it escalate from being pulled over for expired tags to him being killed. Now, something very important here. When you watch the video, um, he so they show uh, Dante on the driver's side of the car, outside the car. He's in between the car and the car door, and they're trying to arrest him there. Okay. Now, uh, Officer Kim Potter was actually training a rookie officer. Um, and there were a number of things that they did wrong besides him being killed. But usually when you're going to arrest somebody, you take them to the, around to the back of the car and you close the car door. The reason why you do that is because you want to create space between them and them being, them being able to get into the car. You don't leave the car door open. The driver's side car door the driver's they're, they're on he was driving a car you don't leave the driver's side car door open and you're trying to arrest him there on the driver's side and he is standing right in front of the uh the door and the door is open you take him to the back of the car close the door and that makes it harder for him to break away and jump into the car and she was there actually training somebody I don't understand that. I don't, that, that doesn't even make any sense. I'm, I'm sitting there watching this. I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. So, okay. Um, I saw this other story here we're going to go to. Uh, over the past few days, and we have not been able to uh, cover it. This is an update to what's going on with um, the voter restriction bills in Georgia and 46 other states across the country also, all right? There was a conference call um, with 100 CEOs and then also celebrities. It... Um, I saw an article from Monday, April 11th, I think it was, Monday, April 11th. And there was one from um, Washington Post, Monday, April 11th. More than, more than 100 corporate executives hold a call to discuss halting, don halting donations and investments to fight controversial voting bills. More than 100 corporate executives hold call to discuss halting donations and investments to fight controversial voting bills. Uh, there was also one else from April 11th. There was one from uh, April 14th. Uh, let's see, there was also, that was, that, okay, that was from the Washington Post, April 11th. There was also one from uh, NBC News from April 11th as well. And I'm going to flip over to this here on the screen share. CEOs discuss pulling donations, additional public, uh, uh, additional public statements 
to fight voting bills. CEOs discuss pulling donations, additional public statements to fight voting bills. So this is a continuation of this whole protest that is uh, taking place. Okay, and we've been covering it here on this show. So there was a, uh, we're going to go to clip three here in just a second. Uh, more than 100 attendees met on Zoom to chart further corporate action, one of the call's organizers said. Okay, so uh, this call was organized. Uh, this one here was uh, organized by uh, Jeffrey uh, Sonnefeld. Jeffrey Sonnefeld. He was one of the call's organizers. He's a professor at the Yale University School of Management. Uh, more than 120 CEOs, business leaders, and experts came together Saturday. Uh, this was Saturday, April 10th, Saturday, April 10th, 2021, to discuss further action against voting legislation nationwide, attendees on the call uh, said. Now, the group discussed numerous options to push back against the Republican led efforts to restrict access to the ballot box, including pulling their donations, refusing to uh, refusing to move businesses or jobs to states that pass restrictive measures and relocating events, said one of the calls organizers, Jeffrey Sonnefeld, who is a, a professor at the Yale University School of Management. Now, Stephanie Rule, on MSNBC spoke with uh, Jeffrey Sonnefeld uh, on uh, April on April 12th, Monday, April 12th. Uh, we're gonna go to clip three. Uh, Shakita, here is uh, that discussion. Take it off mute. bills across the nation. This comes days after Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell... Hey, do me a favor. Start, start it from the beginning. Politics. Start it from the beginning. People walking those comments. He wants their money. Third CEOs met on Zoom Saturday morning to talk about how to deal with the growing pressure over restrictive voting bills across the nation. This comes days after Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell said businesses should stay out of politics. People walking those comments back because, of course, he wants their money... He doesn't want their voices. Let's dig deeper and bring in the call's organizer, the one and only Jeffrey Sonnenfeld. He's a professor at the Yale School of Management. Jeffrey, let's just start here. CEOs, they do not look to weigh in on politics. They follow business. And their main priority is to make sure their customers happy and their employees are happy. And if they've got one and two, then number three, their shareholders will be very, very happy. So isn't this about business? Stephanie, you just nailed it so well in, in framing it. You're right. There's a great uh, pent-up resentment for any political leader to suggest, give us your money and shut up. This is a taxation without representation. Uh, and and uh, so this was a, an act of defiance. They were gathering. They're across the political spectrum. The group was probably 65, 70 percent Republican, and they didn't all agree on what solutions they should follow. But they all were concerned about these voter restrictions. Which, which most, if not all, as far as. All right, just a second here. I think it's buffering on the radio station side. The clip. This is um, Yale. As okay, go ahead. Repression, but they also, uh, you're exactly right, don't want politicians creating wedge issues. They don't want angry uh, communities and finger pointing workforces and, and, and hostile shareholders, that's the, the fabric of social society being torn apart is bad for business. It's it's bad for the personal values of many of these CEOs and the patriot patriotism of a lot of them, but a lot of them just out of as you pointed self interest. The social harmony is in the interest of and free of free markets functioning effectively and that means functioning democracy. Were you surprised? I mean, you were hoping you were going to get a couple dozen CEOs to participate in this. You.
All right. Um, this is Yale School of Management's uh, professor, Jeffrey Sonnefeld. He was uh, one of the organizers of the weekend Zoom call uh, that took place on Saturday, April 10th, with more than 100 business leaders, um, CEOs, et cetera, speaking out against restrictive voting laws across the country. OK, do we have the clip ready? All right. Uh, those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching. We're out of time here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. We're going to keep broadcasting. We'll finish up this clip here. Uh, those watching on my Facebook fan page, the African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel, I M H O T E P. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow night. Remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win Wakanda forever. Stay tuned for democracy now. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. All right, let's let's continue with the clip. They were having problems at the radio station. It's buffering whatever it was doing. Uh, stand by. Hold on. And we're going to continue with this clip here. Just a second. Let me cue this up. How's everybody doing? Uh, share this broadcast on your social media platforms. If you like this type of information, also, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, my online class, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. We have a new section of the class uh, starting up Saturday, April 24th. It's going to be Saturday, April 24th. We have a new section of the class uh, starting up. And we deal with thousands of years of history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Uh, it's a uh, it's going to be a nine week, 18 hour online course that I teach. There were thousands of years of history. And um, all the sessions we do live, but they're recorded, so you can go back and watch them over and over again. They're archived. You can go back and watch them over and over again. Class is regularly $130 on sale, $80. As soon as you register, there's bonus content that you can start watching. I just posted the link here. Um, so look out for that. It's going to be Saturday, April 24th, 2021, uh, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, let's go back to this clip here in a second. Let me cue this up. Just a second. Okay, let's go back to this clip. You had score. I mean, you had some people calling in from Augusta. <laughs> You, you know everything. I, you have a, a camera in here. That's exactly what happened. Is uh, you have seen close up when we've done a, s a small forums. Even uh, came to one of our caucuses in in Washington several years ago. Is like we usually give them six months notice. To give them forty eight hours notice, I thought, boy, inviting one hundred and twenty of these uh, really titanic superstars, these really top super, uh, business leaders, we get maybe ten or twelve. And I'm wondering, how do I fill the the grid of twenty five? of, uh, you know, faces on, a, on the gallery of, of the Hollywood squares you have on these Zoom pages, we wind up with uh, with uh, 120 people, 90 of them, the actual uh, CEO business leaders, uh, and they were very candid and very anxious uh, to, to address these issues and a, a strong mutual reinforcement of those who boldly stepped out front uh, in the past week and, and that were being shot at uh, and the, the notion of uh, suggesting boycotts. You know, when you have the leaders of all the American airline industry from, uh, you know, American Delta and, and United there giving each other air cover. If somebody says boycott the companies, they better be awfully wealthy and have their own private jets. I don't know how they're going to get around. Did more people who participated, did they come to listen and learn or did they have something to say? Well, it's interesting. A lot of them wanted to unravel some of the muddiness that was uh, created intentionally about the Georgia legislation, for example. Okay. And we had legal experts. Michael Waldman uh, of the uh, the Brennan Center on Justice and the political historian uh, Tim Snyder and others there to go through the details of this and as has been reported Ken Fraser and Ken Chenault and others to take a look at how it was 80% uh, better than the original proposal but still 20% quite bad and how the Georgia CEOs figured that out only after it became public they didn't know it was written overnight 
ratified by the lower and upper houses that morning and signed midday by the governor, who surely could not have read the 100 pages himself, and no CEO, and there's no general public review of it. But then they look at the spreading to other 47 states where it's even more pernicious. So there, a lot of it was educational. What's coming up? And we had a lot of documentation and a lot of discussion about what is factually in these other states. So there's some 330 initiatives in these other 47 states. Then there was open discussion about responses. So was there a clear takeaway? To your point, you got over 40 more states about to embark on this. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, and the, according to the, the Brandon Center, it's 47. I thought it was 42 myself going into the event. And then they actually showed us what's unfurling. Some are more pernicious than others, depending on uh, who uh, who's the governor that can veto this and have a veto that's that's not overridden. Uh, but still, the threats were in 47. And, and uh, the, the takeaways are some of them are taking a look at things they could do on the state by state basis. I've just been between we close friends, since I always tell you everything is uh, uh, Brad Karp, the, uh, the the chairman of Paul Weiss, one of the nation's premier law firms, has bonded together the nation's 60 largest law firms, I'm trying to get all the 100 largest law firms together. But he already has SWAT teams ready now to go state by state, starting immediately if there are battles where they need uh, election law expertise to fortify this. There are things like people who are major uh, uh, league owners of teams that are talking about what they're learning from MLB, the, the major league baseball move. By the way, we learned the national surveys was far more popular, even among avid baseball fans than were imagined. So they're taking a look at what options does that give you? So there are many company-specific options. Some are taking then a look at state-by-state -state legislative issues, cutting off funding for the campaigns of legislators that, that fight for these restrictions, or putting on a moratorium, a hold on, on major uh, financial ramp-ups uh, into states that, uh, are, that would put their employees in a position of feeling they're not welcome or denied voice. And other opportunities like looking at paid time off that this this past, they were so excited this past November was not only the largest and most secure election, but the CEOs had a hand in that because this is the first time we not only had millions of workers with paid time off to vote, whatever the hours are, however restricted, but also a million, a little bit more than a million of, of these, these employers, uh, employees had time off to actually work in the polls to help fortify at-risk elderly workers at, at these polling places. So there are some of those kinds of solutions that people, as well as federal legislation, some favor H.R. 1, which is preemptive uh, guidelines, mm -hmm. some favor H.R. 4, which is the, the John Lewis, uh, as you know, uh, uh, Voting Rights Act of 65 reenacted, reactive to catch misconduct. And, and some say there are execution problems with both of those Jeffrey, pieces. Jeffrey, let, so, let me jump in, because we just got breaking news that Will Smith and Apple have just pulled out of a movie they plan to produce in the state of Georgia. Uh, it was titled Emancipation, a slave thriller, obviously in response to what's happening there. Can I get your thoughts on the immediate trickle-down impact? And I'm thinking about the Georgia economy, all of those local Georgia businesses who are dependent on the movie business. Remember, it was a couple of years ago, Stacey Abrams urged the media, the entertainment industry, don't leave Georgia. Our economy needs you. We've heard the same thing from small businesses in Georgia over the last week when, just think about it, they lost 9,000 hotel rooms like that when the MLB decided to leave. So Will Smith, Apple, MLB, talk about how that impacts in the short term the Georgia, Georgia's economy, local economies. Uh, and good for you for clearing the air that Stacey Abrams and others fighting, fighting for voter access in Georgia are not calling for boycotts. They're not calling for moratoriums. They're not calling for any kinds of these disruptive moves. They're afraid of them happening. And this is because, as we, we heard from team owners, that they're listening to their workforces, the, the major league players, in this case, actors that don't want to go into a hostile state. So uh, what's the takeaway from that? And thank you for sharing that breaking news. The takeaway from that, if you're mad about that, then go back to your legislators. The Georgia legislature is technically out of session right now. They could regroup tomorrow. They could go back into special session on the 4th of July. They right now have a, have a special session, which is set for August, where they have a redistricting set. They could revise it then. Or the governor, Governor Kemp, this is the, I think one of the only states in the nation, maybe the only state, where he has it until the 1st of July, months after he already signed it, to rescind his signature, to put public pressure on him to rescind his signature and fix the law. But but if you, people are, are uncomfortable going there, then they're paying an economic price. But again, None of the voting rights advocates in Georgia have been lobbying in favor of these kinds of things. They're just afraid of such things. As you saw, some pretty harsh statements coming out of Microsoft 
which was in the process of, of sending many employees in there too. And this is this is not isolated to you know to entertainment or to sports across the board. There's some major financial institutions that are looking at putting on hold the movement of people into Georgia right now. All right. So that was from uh, Monday, uh, April 12th on MSNBC with uh, Stephanie Rule. She spoke with Yale, uh, Yale University School of Management Professor Jer uh, Jeffrey Sonnefeld, who was one of the organizers of a Zoom call that took place on uh, Saturday, April 10th, that had over 100 uh, CEOs of corporations, and they are uh, organizing to speak out against the restrictive uh, uh, voting laws, the voter restricted uh, voter restriction laws that uh, we know passed um, SB 202 passed in Georgia, but 46 other states are proposing similar laws as well. OK, uh, so the, there are a number of different articles written about this. I showed you uh, a couple of them. Um, we have. Let's see here. Uh, this one here from this one is from April 14th by Jane C. Tim uh, for um, NBC, NBCnews.com. Hundreds of CEOs, celebrities, corporations joined forces to oppose discriminatory voting legislation. OK, so this article came out after the interview that we uh, just heard. Uh, the interview was on Monday, April 11th. Dozens of companies, including. Uh, Amazon, Google, Starbucks, and Netflix join hundreds, hundreds of business leaders, celebrities, law firms, and nonprofit, uh, nonprofit organizations to sign new, to sign a new statement opposing any discriminatory legislation. Signed a new statement opposing any discriminatory uh, legislation that would restrict ballot access. Now, the statement appearing Wednesday as advertisements in the New York Times and the Washington Post is the latest and largest mobilization by corporate America against restrictive voting legislation advanced by Republicans around the country. OK, this is the latest and largest uh, effort to fight against the uh, voter restriction uh, laws. Uh, proposed by Republicans across the country. All right, now the two full uh, the the two full pages of the ad reads: "We stand for democracy. We all should feel a responsibility to defend the right to vote and to oppose any discriminatory legislation or measures that restrict or prevent any eligible voter." from having an equal and fair opportunity to cast a ballot. In addition uh, to companies and their leaders, the statement's signatories include celebrities, uh, major law firms, and nonprofit organizations. Uh, the New York Times first reported the statement. Now, Target, Bank of America, Apple, Cisco, Berkshire, uh, Berkshire Partners, American Express, and Wells Fargo. Um, American Express and Wells Fargo were among dozens of corporations that signed on, while uh, George Clooney, Paula Abdul, Michael Bloomberg, uh, Mark Ruffalo, the Incredible Hulk in the uh, Avengers movies, Mark Ruffalo, Demi Lovato, uh, Brian Cornell, chair and CEO of uh, Target, uh, Brian Cornell, and Warren Buffett were among hundreds of individuals. Josh Kushner, brother to uh, uh, Donald Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, and founder of venture capital firm, of the venture capital firm Thrive Capital, also signed the letter. Now, the show of force comes as Republicans across the country work to advance uh, hundreds of restrictions, 300 and, as of March 24, the uh, Brennan Center for Justice has tracked 361 uh, voter restriction bills in 47 state legislatures as of March 24. 
Now, the um, Republicans say they must restore, I'm sorry, the show of force comes as Republicans across the country work to advance hundreds of restrictions, changes that voting rights advocates and civil rights groups argue would disproportionately affect voters of color. Now, Republicans say that they must restore trust in American elections, even as they continue to cast doubt on the integrity of the election uh, that Donald Trump lost, the 2020 election, they're still pushing the big lie. They created largely the doubt that people have. They lied and said the election was stolen. They filed 61 frivolous lawsuits in court. Almost all those lawsuits were thrown out. The only one they won was in Pennsylvania, and that dealt with how close poll watchers could be to poll workers counting votes, okay? They lied. They lied. They pushed the big lie. They pushed the stolen election, okay? Not only that, many of them were involved in an insurrection that took place January 6th at the U.S. Capitol building. And then now they're trying to pass these voter restriction bills to address a lie that they created. Now, by all accounts, the 2020 election was secure and its results accurate. Nonetheless, there are more than 350 restrictive election bills being considered in 47 state legislatures, according to the nonpartisan Brennan Center for Justice at New York um, at, at uh, New York University, which has been tracking the legislation. Now, Mike Ward, W-A-R-D, co-founder of the Civic Alliance, a nonpartisan group, that encourages civic participation from businesses said, I think it's unquestionable. I think it's an unquestionable show of unity from the business community that democracy is a priority. Okay. Now, Mike Ward uh, said he helped do outreach to corporations about signing the letter. He said, we did not get a lot of no's. He told NBC news um, here that this is a tweet from Jane C. Tim who wrote this article uh, the two-page spread in today's New York Times and Washington Post with hundreds of corporations, individuals, celebrities, and other prominent figures opposing voting restrictions. Okay, we stand for democracy. So this is, uh, you can check this out. We'll post a link here. You can check out that ad. Um, now, Republicans have pushed back against such corporate pressure. Senate Majority Leader Moscow Mitch McConnell, Republican from Kentucky, warned corporate America to stay out of politics before softening his stance a day later, saying, quote, I didn't say that very artfully yesterday. They're certainly entitled to be involved in politics. They are. My principal complaint is that uh, they didn't read the darn bill. OK, well, most of you all that signed it didn't read it either. And we know it, uh, SB 202 is, is uh, uh, we know that um, uh, Brian Kemp signed it an hour after it passed uh, in the Senate. So he didn't sign it either. I mean, he didn't, he didn't read it either. All right, we're going to post this link here to this article. Uh, so check this out. And then there's also one from the uh, New York Times as well that uh you can read this uh, also hundreds of companies hundreds of companies unite to oppose voting limits but others abstain okay amazon google gm and starbucks were among those joining the biggest show of solidarity by businesses over legislation in numerous states okay and, and you see uh, uh kenneth frazier of merck pharmaceuticals and also, this is uh, Ken Chenault, former CEO of American Express, uh, Mary Barra, um, CEO of uh, General Motors, and then Kevin Johnson, who is uh, CEO of uh, Starbucks. OK, so you can check out this article as well from uh, New York Times. You're going to hear more about this. This is an example. This is this is how pressure pays off. And this is leveraging our economics, putting economic pressure on corporations to speak out on our behalf and and and, and latinos and uh younger people who tend to vote democratic etc this is leveraging our economics to enforce our politics this is an example of this okay 
Um, and see, this is this is what they did back in 2015 and 2016, uh, 2015, and then also North Carolina around 2017 with the uh, transgender bathroom bills. This is what corporations did on behalf of, on behalf of the LGBT community. Okay, but they but but you didn't have to put pressure on them. They just came out in support uh, and, and, and denounced um, uh, the the bathroom bills. Okay, and and threatened to cancel uh, the threatened to uh, uh, cancel conferences and shut down business and different things like this uh, in in these states because of that bathroom bill. All right, so we'll talk some more about that in the next coming days. Uh, I want to go to I, I want to go to this uh, next clip here. In researching this segment, this is uh, I, I think I saw this clip on MSNBC, but I found it in uh, researching this information. So uh, on April eighth, on um, MSNBC, uh, Stephanie Rule did a segment with. Um, uh, Jane Tim, who uh, who wrote the article that, that we just talked about dealing with the 100 CEOs, she wrote the article for um, NBC News. This deals with fact-checking claims about Georgia's controversial new voting law, because the uh, as you uh, as was said in the interview she did with Jeffrey Sonnefeld, it is true. The original proposed bill in Georgia was much worse than what actually passed. What passed is terrible, but what was proposed was even worse. That is true. But there's some confusion that some people have about what's actually in the bill because there were reports about what was going to be in the bill. But some of those things were not in the actual bill that was actually passed and was signed in the law. So this deals with fact checking claims about Georgia's controversial new voting law. This morning, the anger is intensifying over Georgia's recently passed voting law, but it could just be the tip of the iceberg. At least 361 new laws have been proposed in 47 states to limit mail-in early, in-person and election day voting. And as criticism grows from corporations and Democrats, Republicans are pointing to blue state election laws as proof of an alleged double standard. Jane Tim has been busy doing some serious fact checking and for fact's sake, she joins us now. First, there's confusion about what was originally in the Georgia bill and what actually passed. Can you clear this up? Yeah, so some of the early provisions they looked at would have limited who could vote by mail, would have cut early voting. The eventual bill actually bans early voting. Um, and that sort of seemed like maybe a dollop of sugar designed to make this go down a little easier, but it, it didn't work for corporations and for Democrats who said there's any barriers to the ballot box or just too many. Some Republicans are defending Georgia's law and they're pointing to Colorado, saying both states have voter ID requirements and they claim Colorado has fewer early voting options. I mean, they got a lot of drop boxes in that state. So how accurate is this argument? This is a pretty uh, unserious Harrison, because Colorado runs their elections almost entirely by mail. So while Georgia might have more early voting, Colorado's 15 days of early voting serves like 10% of the voters. And their voter ID policy is non-strict. You can use a utility bill, a paycheck. Georgia, we're talking photo ID from the government. Uh, let me show this still picture just one second here. So voting comparison, Colorado to Georgia, Colorado to Georgia, okay? I've heard the argument that some Republicans want to make. Oh, th th there's more restrictive voting bills in Democratic states, things like this. So in Colorado, ballots mailed automatically to eligible voters. In Georgia, illegal for election officials to mail out absentee ballot applications to all voters. Colorado, variety of ID eligible, uh, a variety of ID eligible, including utility bills, paychecks, and more to, to uh, as a former ID when you go to vote. 
In Georgia, absentee voters must include driver's license number, driver's license number, or other state ID number. Okay? Absentee voters. So with Colorado, there's a variety of ways, a variety of means you can use to identify who you are. All right, uh, let's go back to this clip here. Let's talk about Kentucky, a place we do not think of as a bastion of bipartisanship. What's going on there with voting laws? Yeah, we actually saw lawmakers come together with broad bipartisan support and pass an election bill that standardizes a lot of their pandemic reforms. So things like early voting, drop boxes, an online portal where you can request your, your mail-in ballot if you're an absentee voter. Uh, we see two parties who think it's in their best interest to make it easier to vote. And a big part of that is because Republicans did very well in 2020 with these ex restrictions or with these expansions, I mean. So they're looking at it and saying, hey, the more the merrier. Let's turn people out. Joining me now to discuss all of this, the lawmaker behind that new executive order, Mayor of Atlanta, Keisha Lance Bottoms. Mayor, thank you for being here. What exactly do you want to accomplish with this executive order? The law's already passed. Well, thank you for having me. And what we want to accomplish is to communicate with our 1.2 million water customers in the metro Atlanta. Okay, so that's that's the end of that segment. Uh, we'll let this clip play here. Uh, this is from April 7th. This is from um, Wednesday, April 7th. Um, MSNBC, Stephanie Rule spoke with Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms about the controversial Georgia bill. Uh, SB 202 after uh, Major League Baseball decided to move its all-star game from Georgia and backlash against the state's uh, controversial voting law. Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms issued an executive order that aims to counteract the legislation's restrictions. She explains what what it does and tells Stephanie Rule uh, the quote most dangerous end quote, part of the voting law is the state legislature's new role in the election process. Okay, um, let's go to this clip here. Mayor, thank you for being here. What exactly do you want to accomplish with this executive order? The law's already passed. Well, thank you for having me. And what we want to accomplish is to communicate with our 1.2 million water customers in the metro Atlanta area what this new law means, how they can get the appropriate ID, the new rules related to absentee, ball uh, absentee ballots. We want our customers to be informed. So Ambassador Young tells a great story of one day of early, of one day of voting when he first ran for Congress, a thunderstorm, and 74% turnout in the African-American community. So even though there may be barriers, we can still overcome those barriers and we want to make sure that our customers are informed so that they will know what they need to do to be able to cast their ballots when the time comes. We have heard a lot about no food or water in line, but beyond those headlines, what is the most dangerous part of this bill? The most dangerous part of this bill, in my opinion, is the dowling back of or, or giving to the state legislature control over the election process. In the midst of this 98 page bill, um, there are provisions that strip the Secretary of State of a position on the election board. And then so I want to pause it here to show show you this. OK, so um, and we've talked about this before, one of the provisions in SB 202 is that the state legislature can take over county boards if it's an election result that they don't like. The state legislature can take over, the, like the state, the state board can take over, the, the, like the state board of canvassers, they can take over the uh, county board of canvassers and overturn election results. Uh, Georgia's new voting law, less, less time to request absentee ballot new ID requirements for absentee ballots, fewer drop boxes, stricter drop off hours. Legislature has more control over state election board. OK, so this is uh, this is like Jim Crow era stuff.
Let's go back to this clip. Secretary of State of a position on the election board, and it essentially gives oversight to the Republican led state legislature. Uh, that's not the way elections should be run. Elections should not be run by a legislature. They should be seen, overseen by the Secretary of State in a fair manner. And there's so many provisions in this bill, the dialing back of the window for asking for absentee ballots. You mentioned not being able to pass out water in line. There are a number of provisions in this bill that make it more difficult for people to access the ballot. To that very point, it was the Georgia Secretary of State that protected the legal and fair election and outcome in Georgia. If this new law was in place six months ago, would all of the Georgians who voted in November have been able to? And would former President Trump have been successful at his legal challenge? Well, you hit the nail on the head. This is about being able to shave off a couple of points in the state. We know that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, Raphael Warnock, and John Ossoff won by just a very slim margin in Georgia. And this is what this bill is all about. It's about shaving off a few people in various counties across Georgia. A number of people access absentee ballot uh, this year. A number of people use drop boxes this year. And you asked about the most dangerous part of this provision. It also gives the state legislature and the election board the opportunity to take over county elections. That's a very dangerous precedent, and it is, is anti-democratic when these should be fairly held an impartial election. All right. So uh, that is from April 7th, 2021. Um, MSNBC, uh, Stephanie Rule, interviewing Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, okay? So the fight continues. The fight continues. And, and we're dealing with a fight really in 50 states because the bills are in 47 state legislatures. You got 39 bills in a Michigan state legislature. Now, Governor Gretchen Whitmer, Democrat, says she's going to veto those bills. But this is what this is what Republicans are doing. OK. All right. Uh, last story. Feb uh, April 12th, 1787. Um, the Free African Society was founded. We did not get a chance to talk about this uh, yesterday. We dealt with some more history dealing with H.R. Uh, 40 passing the uh, House Judiciary Committee so it could go to the uh, full floor vote in the Senate. So we talked a lot about history on Wednesday's show. But uh, the Free African Society uh, was founded in Pennsylvania, April 12, 1787, by, uh, by uh, Absalom Jones and Richard Allen. Absalom Jones and Richard Allen, okay? And we know they also founded the um, African Methodist Episcopal Church uh, as well. So this was a mutual aid society. It was it was a form of um, when we talk about cooperative economics, this was a type of co-op. It was a mutual aid society. It's a very, very uh, uh, important piece of our history. And in the book, um, Collective Courage, Collective Courage by uh, Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard. Uh, she talks about a history of the co-ops and various mutual aid societies and all different types of things like this. Okay, so, uh, and let me see something here. Just one second. Let's, uh, All right, so when we look at the history of the um, Free African Society, on April 12, 1787, Rips, uh, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones founded the Free African Society in Philadelphia. 
uh, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to be a multi-denomination mutual aid organization, a multi-denomination mutual aid organization for free people, for free African people, so that they could gather strength and develop leaders in the African American community. Now, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones uh, were both both religious figures and formerly enslaved men who had purchased their freedom before moving to Philadelphia, where they met and found a uh, common cause. Now, the Free African Society was a benevolent organization grounded in Christian religious faith and operating outside denominational differences to serve the social needs of African Americans in Philadelphia. In the Encyclopedia of Greater Philadelphia, it is noted that members in good standing could expect a number of benefits from the mutual aid fund, particularly, particularly in the first years of the society. Important aspects of support for members included payments for burials, uh, burying loved ones, pay, pay, uh, payments for burials, and pro providing financial aid for widows and other family members of the deceased. Finding apprenticeships for children to learn a trade and paying tuition for members' children for members' children if places in free schools were not available. Now, over time, the society the Free African Society expanded to care for the social and economic well-being of its members by providing moral, moral guidance, by helping newcomers to uh, the city feel welcome, and by giving assistance during periods of financial difficulty brought on by unemployment or sickness. Now, the Free African Society also took on the task of assisting the sick during the yellow fever epidemic in 1793. Members nursed the sick, dug graves, and buried the dead and transported the ill to quarters outside of the city where they could be quarantined and give medical aid. The preamble to the founding documents of the Free African Society describe, describes why they founded the society and its mission. Why they founded the society and its mission. It says, whereas Absalom Jones and Richard Allen, the two men of the African race, who for their religious life and, and conversation have obtained a good report among men, and let me switch over here um, so you can see this. This comes from the Zen Education Project. Also, there's an article from blackpass.org as well on the Free African Society. The Free African Society. So this is during slavery, and we were identifying with Africa. Okay, today you got African Americans who don't want to who who don't want to be African don't want to don't want to have anything to do with Africa don't want to have anything to do with Africa don't want to call themselves Africans they'd rather be black or whatever it don't but during slavery we were identifying with Africa now this comes from the Zen education project April 12th, 1787, Free African Society founded. This is Richard, is Absalom Jones and Richard Allen. Now, the preamble to their founding documents describes why they founded the Free African Society. And here's the uh, document right here on the right. But it says, whereas Absalom Jones and Richard Allen, two men of the African race. They didn't say two men of the Negro race. They said two men of the African race who for their religious life and conversation have obtained a good report among men 
these persons from a love, these persons from a love to the people of their complexion, whom they behold, who, who whom they beheld with sorrow because of their irreligious and uncivilized state, often communed together upon this painful and important subject in order to form some kind of religious society, but there being too few to be found under the like, under the like concern and those who were differed in their religious sentiments. With these circumstances, they labored for some time till it was proposed after a serious communication of sentiments that a society should be formed without regard to religious tenets. A society should be formed without regard to religious tenets, provided the persons lived an orderly and sober life in order to support one another in sickness and for the benefit of their widows and fatherless children. The Free African Society took monthly dues and used the funds to support African Americans in Philadelphia, including widows and orphans. The surviving widow of a deceased member should enjoy the benefit of this society so long as she remains his widow complying with the rules thereof accepting the subscriptions the children of our deceased members be under the care of the society so far as to pay for the education of their children so far as to pay for the education of their children if they cannot attend the free school also to put them out uh, also to put them out apprentices to uh to suitable trades or places if required okay uh now richard allen left the free african society when it grew more quaker under religious influence from the society of friends he went on to found the uh first african methodist episcopal church uh mother bethel uh african methodist episcopal ame church in 1794 uh, so read this uh, read this article here at zeneducationproject.org. Uh, April 12, 1787, Free African Society founded. April 12, 1787, the Free African Society founded. And then also, um, they also have an article at blackpass.org, blackpass.org on the Free African Society. Uh, and there's a, a historical marker there in Philadelphia. Uh, Free African Society established in 1787 under the leadership of Richard Allen and Absalom Jones. This organization fostered identity, leadership, and unity among blacks and became the forerunner of the first African American churches in this city. So uh, read this also from blackpast.org, okay? And um, throughout the late 18th century, the Free African Society served as one of, one of the city's uh, leading black philanthropic organizations besides absalom jones its members included notable african-american abolitionists abolitionist men such as cyrus bustle james fortin and william gray with the exception of james fortin most of the founding men were former slaves the organization functioned as a mutual as both a mutual aid society and club where members of uh, uh of philadelphia's African-American elite could socialize and forge business relationships with one another. By 1794, the society had become large enough to accomplish its original goal when members built their own house of worship, St. Thomas African Episcopal Church. Once again, the word African, St. Thomas African Episcopal Church in 1794. 
church leaders initially offered the pastorate, uh, pastorate um, to uh, Richard Allen in an effort to persuade him to rejoin the society. After Allen rejected the offer, Absalom Jones accepted the appointment of the church's first pastor. Okay, so read more about the Free African Society also at uh, blackpast.org, P-A-S-T. All right, look, hey, we have to get out of here. Uh, if you want to support the African History Network, uh, you can do so through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHO, AHN show through Cash App. Uh, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. When you do it through Cash App, uh, be sure to type in dollar sign, the AHN show, S-H-O-W, and it will um, show, it'll show my, it'll say Michael and show my picture there. All right. Uh, and then you can also... Um, Support us at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Click on the yellow don donate button. But all my DVD lectures are there also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, you can register for the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We have a new section starting up uh, Saturday, April 24th, 2021, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can watch from around the world. All right, we have to get out of here. Right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow night. Peace.